Be seated. You pray for the choir as we sing tonight. for some other church somewhere, and uh, so I'm going to make them work tonight. They're going to sing something's happening, then they're going to come around after the choir goes down and sing a special for us. So you pray for the choir as we sing, something's happening.
to say it's good to be home tonight. As um, David said, we're not off singing somewhere else. So um, it's always good to be at Victory. And uh, even when we're not here, our heart is still here. Our spirit's here, and we miss you guys. And I just want to say thank you because every time we walk in the door, um, you always say, it's good. We're so glad you're home tonight. And I know you're praying for us when we're gone, and that means so much more than you'll ever know. So uh, we're going to sing a new song that we just learned a couple weeks ago. And it seems like I can't sing this song without crying, but you'll understand why when you hear the words. There are times in this life when fear is so heavy and burdens weigh on your mind. You are weak in the knees and no strength can you find, but just right on time my Jesus he's always on time and though you may see a valley he sees the mountain you'll be standing to the test I have watched as the storms blew and with the thunder but in each trial God knows what's best and I am so glad he knows what's best
special anointing on that song and I felt something on it as they began to sing and uh, I pick on Jeremy and Krista I want them to be here all the time but I know that uh, God has opened doors for them they have many opportunities and I can understand why they sing so much because everybody wants to hear them they do a wonderful job and nobody's more proud of Jeremy and Krista than their home church right here at Victory Baptist Church. We love them. Thank you for your ministry. God has anointed them with wonderful voices. It's always a treat when they can come and be with us. And that something's happening has still got it, don't it? I love to hear that wonderful song. And I thank you so much. I like that, Jeremy and Krista. And I love the Wilkes ministry as they... Tell people about Jesus Christ in song. If you like singing, you need to be here next Sunday night. We're going to have a singing, uh, 11th hour. I told somebody a moment ago, uh, you know, there's, there's people that sing, and then there's people that minister, and they'll be here with us. These, these uh, young people right here, my goodness, I think they're probably just in their 20s, but they can evermore sing. They're anointed and uh, ministry minded they're from the great state of Louisiana and they'll be here with us and uh, tell all your friends and your neighbors and we'll just have a big time next uh, Sunday night at 6.30 and you be here uh, for that alright I want you to take your Bibles now and turn with me to the book of Acts Acts chapter number 8 the 8th chapter of the book of Acts and in just a few moments I want to pick up the reading at verse number 35 and we'll read down to about verse 39. I would invite you now to be finding with me the 8th chapter of the book of Acts and tonight we'll read verses 35 through 39. We'll also look at some of these other verses as well. And for the most part, you are taught in preaching and teaching, never just jump right into the passage. Don't just dive right into the text. First, you've got to set it up. You've got to give the background. You've got to give the context. You have to kind of tell the story. But tonight, I'm going to do that a little later. I want to go ahead and just begin our reading in Acts chapter number Eight. You've heard me say this before. The book of Acts, I believe, is the most exciting book in all the Word of God. Some have called the book of Acts the fifth gospel. But actually, it is the bridge between the gospels and the epistles. And there's a lot of things happening in the book of Acts. Things are moving and shaking in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is an active book. I mean, that makes sense for the Govan. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. But if I could change that, I would call it the Acts of the Apostles as empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you could say that the book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came in the book of Acts. Now, he's always been, Brother Ray, but in the book of Acts, the Spirit of God comes to permanently live and dwell and abide within believers. So the Holy Spirit has now come to electrify the church and to energize the church. Did you know tonight we are Victory Baptist Church? We are part of the church. And for 2,000 years now, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been rolling on. Somebody said the church is going under. Don't you believe a word of that? The church of Jesus is not going under. Praise God, she's going over. The church of Jesus Christ is not on the way down. She's on the way up. For 2,000 years now, God has moved and worked and operated in the New Testament church. The church was born. It was, 
It was birthed in the book of Acts. So there's much activity in the book of Acts. You remember one time Jesus said, Wait, tarry here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1 in verse number 8, Jesus gives the apostolic commission. He says, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. I thought about this today. The Holy Spirit has more power than Georgia power. The Holy Spirit has more power than the Southern Company. Now, Brother David worked for the Southern Company and I don't fully understand this. I'm not a technical mind. But I am told that the power plants actually generate and produce power. And then they somehow harness that power and put it on a grid, whatever a grid is. And then they can route the power. They can reroute it. They can direct it. They can send power here. They can send power there. And I guess the Holy Spirit is the grid of heaven. He sends power all over this earth. In fact, the same Holy Spirit power that worked that day at Pentecost is the same power that flows here at Victory Baptist Church. And I'm not afraid of that word Pentecostal. In fact, I want Victory Baptist Church to be a Pentecostal church, to rely on the power of God. But now let's, let's notice Acts chapter number 8. You don't know what's happening here, but I'm going to read it, then we'll go back. And I'm going to talk tonight about one of my favorite Bible characters. I want to introduce you tonight and kind of do a biography and a profile of this man named Philip. Now, I learned this today. I didn't know it, and I don't really know what this means, but for whatever it's worth, the name Philip means lover of horses. Literally, that's what the name Philip means. I don't know what all that has to do with, but if your name is Philip, I guess you'd just giddy up and ride a horse. The lover of horses. One day I will ride a horse, by the way. I will. Notice verse number 35. Then Philip opened his mouth. If you're going to tell somebody about Jesus, you've got to open your mouth. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Brother Felton, Philip was a Jesus preacher. Notice verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What holds me back? What, what keeps me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest, with all thine heart. One day, the Philippian jailer asked a question. He said, what must I do to be saved? How, how do I get saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be saved. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You can get baptized when you believe on Jesus. And he answered and said, I like this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, I want to say amen right there. I believe it too. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the Bible says... Those who have the Son have life. 
And those who have not the Son have not life. Verse 8. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water. Notice that. They went into the water. No sprinkling. They went into the water. Bless God, if you're going to baptize them, baptize them. They went down both into the water. Both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. The Greek word baptizo, to submerge, to dunk, to immerse. Verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Time out. That sounds like a rapture to me. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. I mean, vanished into thin air. And then it says, and he went on his way rejoicing. But now wait a minute. Philip didn't go to heaven just then because verse 40 tells us Philip was found at Azotus and passing through he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. But now notice verse number 35. I, I want to call your attention to verse 35. Look at it, Brother Ronald. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him religion. And preached unto him tradition. And preached unto him emotion. And preached unto him denomination. And preached unto him law. Oh no. And preached unto him Jesus. Can I say a word right here? I will never apologize for being a Jesus preacher. Somebody says, does preaching Jesus still work? Are you kidding me? It's the only thing that does work. It's always worked and it will always work and the hope for the United States of America is not a bunch of Republican candidates in a debate. I want to say, friend, it's not a Democrat either. I want to say it this way. The hope of the United States of America is none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. So preach Jesus and teach Jesus and proclaim Jesus and share Jesus and tell people about Jesus. The Bible says that Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. I want to talk to you tonight for just a little while. And I know I preach louder than Brother Junior. Brother Rick said I have to cut him way up and I have to cut you way down. I know that, but that's okay because I talk loud. I get excited. And I want to preach tonight for just a while, if God would help me on this subject, Philip the Evangelist. Philip the Evangelist. In Acts chapter 21 in verse number 8, the Bible refers to Philip as the Evangelist. Philip the evangelist. The Bible says that the evangelist Philip preached unto him Jesus. For several weeks now, that word evangelism, that thought evangelism has been on my mind. It's been on my heart. I've been thinking about evangelism. I've been studying about evangelism. Last Sunday morning I preached an entire sermon about doing the work of an evangelist. You do understand that doing the work of an evangelist, well, it's, it's work. And I remember a few weeks ago I told you this, that some things have to happen if evangelism is going to take place. Can I tell you again? Let me just remind you. I need to hear this. If evangelism is going to take place, Lost people have to be present. Now there's lost people every Sunday morning at Victory Baptist Church. No doubt there's lost people here tonight at Victory Baptist Church. When we assemble down here at the house of God, I mean every week there are lost people present. And if you just always preach to save people, 
Chances are nobody's going to get saved. But if lost people hear the good news of Jesus Christ, they just might get saved. And you know what? There's lost people on your workplace. There, there's lost people at your job. There's lost people at school, young people. And I understand school starts back tomorrow. There's going to be lost people there. In fact, a whole lot of lost people. Well, there's lost people at the ball field. There's lost people at the restaurant. There's lost people at Walmart. And whenever you get lost people together, whenever there's a lost person, Brother Rocky, evangelism can take place. So evangelism happens when there's lost people there. And then number two, when a clear-cut presentation of the gospel is given. When you tell people about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I wonder how many people just within a five-mile radius of this church have still never heard a clear-cut presentation of the gospel. Preach Jesus. Do the work of an evangelist. So when you get lost people there and when somebody stands up and shares the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then number three, when you give an opportunity to respond to the gospel. We call that an altar call. We call that an invitation. Did you know? There's people in the Baptist church, the Southern Baptist Convention, that says that's outdated. Stop doing it. People don't like to be confronted with their spiritual state. But I got to thinking about that. Jesus gave a public invitation and he said, Come, follow me. We call that the public profession of faith. You know what? That little girl this morning, I was thinking, Lord, let somebody move. Let somebody come to Christ. Well, I never had seen that girl in my life. In fact, I'd never seen her grandmother. And they slipped out right over there, Brother Bill, right over there kind of close to you, and she walked down here to the front, and she said exactly what the preacher told her to, I want to be Say, Boy, that set me on fire. That thrilled my heart. Hey, I need to see that sometimes. The preacher and the pastor needs to experience that sometimes. The church needs to experience that. This past week I was in revival at Friendship in Rome. And boy, it's a good church. But I like victory best. But, but I preached every night. I had a great time. Monday and Tuesday night, preached to the church. And, and I guess they, they would say I was the evangelist. And on Wednesday night, Brother Ronald, you know, Brother Horton, Brother Roger Horton, man, he's a good soul winner. He stood up there and this is what he said. He kept repeating. And I thought, Lord God, what's he saying that for? This is what he said. He said, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. That's from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And I kept thinking about that. He's right. Summer's about to come to a close. While well, they're going back to school now, there's been a harvest. But the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and some are not saved. And I felt something on that. Now, I'm not one of these spooky, superstitious preachers, but every now and then, the Holy Spirit will give me discernment. And I really felt in my heart, I didn't know for sure, but I really felt the nudge of the Holy Ghost. And I, and I really felt somebody just might be saved tonight. I felt it. I felt it. And I stood up and I preached about being in the no and the no being in you. And I preached that message and gave the invitation and, and, and several came to pray and just kept, kept praying, Lord, do a work tonight. Save some soul tonight. And Brother Roger got up there. He's old time. He begs them. And you know what? I guess some lady in her 50s or so slipped up out of her. Somebody said, they don't walk an aisle anymore. Well, they did that night. She actually walked an aisle and came to the front and said, I don't know if I'm saved. I want to get it nailed down. In fact, I want to be saved tonight. And boy, it thrilled me. I mean, I was, I was rejoicing. And then I began to pray, Lord, 
what happened tonight here in Floyd County. Let it happen Sunday morning in Polk County. I began to pray for the man of God. I began to pray for Brother Junior. I, I knew how he was going to preach just a simple, sweet gospel message. That's exactly what he did. And he just simply said, come to Jesus. And you know what? She came. And that has lit my fire. That has rung my bell. It makes me think about Philip in the New Testament book of Acts. He's known as Philip the Evangelist. Did you know that every saved person has a responsibility to do the work of an evangelist? I don't know if I've shared this or not, but let me share it. Every year I go down to North Jacksonville Baptist Church. My dad and I go there on Sunday morning and hear Dr. Herb Revis. It's a great church. And, and almost always, I think it's every year I've ever been, they always give a gospel invitation. And you'd be surprised at how many people come forward. I mean, sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's ten, sometimes it's twelve. I mean, it's, it's a slew of people. And I'm thinking, my soul, hallelujah, I rejoice. You mean all these people have come today to be saved? And I thought they got saved right then. Well, I asked somebody about that, and this is what they told me. Well, sometimes that happens, but not usually. What, what we teach our people to do and train our people to do is once they leave the church, they're going to go out there during the week and win somebody to Christ. Maybe in the neighborhood, maybe on the golf course, wherever, on the job, and they, they do evangelism, personal, one-on-one, -on -one soul winning. And we're teaching our members to go out and do the work of the evangelist. It's not just the pastor's place. If he preaches good, they might get saved. So you know what they told me? They said, that's all the people that's been won to Christ during the week. And then we bring them to church on Sunday so they can make it known and so they can make their public profession of faith. And I thought, that's it. That's it right there. Teach the people, train the people to go out and tell them about Jesus and do the work of evangelism out there and then bring them to church. Hallelujah for evangelism. Do you know that Philip was an evangelistic deacon? Kind of thinking about deacons today. Philip was one of those very first, I think it was seven men, seven deacons. They were servants, they were ministers and the work got so big, the preachers and the pastors, they couldn't do it all. So they had deacons who would wait on tables and take care of widows and orphans. And Philip was one of those very first deacons. Can I do a timeout? Have you ever heard people in the Baptist church kind of make a joke about this, how preachers and deacons don't get along? I don't know where that came from. I've never had a cross word with our deacons. I love our deacons. And our deacons love me. And all the deacons said... I got to make sure they love me. But I got to thinking about that. Lord God, why would the preacher and the deacons not get along? We're co-laborers. We're doing the very same thing. I need them. They need me. And Philip was one of those good godly deacons who deeped. And, 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 and Philip, you know what deacon is, don't you? That's what the deacons do. Like a plumber plums, the deacon deeks. Well, if you read this in context, Philip was around when Stephen got stoned to death. Stephen's one of my heroes in the New Testament. I like Philip too, but man, what about Stephen? Man, Stephen, he stood up, he wouldn't shut up. And they took rocks and hurled those stones at Stephen and killed him dead. He was stoned to death. In fact, Paul, Saul at that time, Saul was consenting unto his death. That probably means he ordered it. He called for it. And the Bible says that Saul made havoc of the church. He ridiculed the church and persecuted the church. And the Bible says that those believers got scattered all over. Now you say, preacher, that's bad. No, it was good. 
because what the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. And as they got scattered with the cleave, they began to tell more and more people about Jesus Christ. They did the work of evangelism. So now, I just want to make three or four little quick statements about Philip and then we'll be done. He's Philip the evangelist, Brother W.L. I want you to see this, first of all. Philip exalting. Philip exalting. Go back and notice verse number 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He was exalting Jesus. I tell preachers all the time, we got preachers right down here in the front, and I just always say, make much of Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Make sure you preach Jesus. Why, you'll never go wrong preaching Jesus if you'll go back and look at Acts chapter 8 and verse number 5. The Bible says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Everywhere he went, he was exalting Jesus. I thought about that. The Bible says that Philip went down to Samaria. Now, now, Samaria is one of those places Jesus said to go. Jerusalem, Judea, and, and Samaria. But now here's what you need to understand about Samaria. And I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm just going to tell you what they called them. They called them ethnic half-breeds. They said, well, you ain't Jew and you ain't Gentile. You don't belong to either one. Somebody said he that's in the middle of the road gets hit from both sides. Well, they're right in the middle of the road. They're, they're, they're pagans. They're heathen. But did you know that's exactly where Philip goes and Philip begins to preach Jesus Christ to them low-down, rotten Samaritans while they're not like us. They don't look like us. I, I really believe if Philip were here tonight, this is what he would say. I will preach Jesus to a black man. I'll preach Jesus to a white man. I'll preach Jesus to a brown man. I'll preach Jesus to a Democrat. I'll preach Jesus to a Republican. I'll preach Jesus to somebody that's mean. I'll preach Jesus to somebody that's nice. I'll preach to Jews. I'll preach to Gentiles. I remember a few years ago, several years ago, my goodness, 12, 15 years ago, I preached two revivals at some small little church up in Somerville. Pam, I think y'all used to sing up there. And I'll just say it plain. Man, they were wildcats at that church. They, they had all kind of weird looking people <laughs> at that church. And man, I walked in there and I could tell, I thought, Lord, what have I got myself into? And, and, and some of them people I was told used to be in gangs and they used to be rough characters. In fact, sometimes when I was preaching, they even acted a little bit rowdy. I, I didn't know if I was going to get in a fight or what was going to happen. But I, but I just found out, even though they didn't look like I wanted them to look, even though they didn't look Baptist like me, even though they didn't wear a coat like me and told a black King James Bible, you know what I said, while I'm here, I'm going to make the best of it and I'm going to tell them about Jesus and the same crowd that looked at me ugly and made fun of me at the end of the service while they's down there in the front kneeling, weeping, crying out to God and many of them got saved. Hey, you just tell them about Jesus. That's what Philip did while he went over there to Samaria. And he preached, and if you'll keep reading this here, unclean spirits began to come out and those that were sick were healed. And then we read about a man called Simon the Sorcerer. You know what a sorcerer is? It's somebody that practices witchcraft. He was a male witch. I think you call that a warlock. He was a soothsayer. And he was telling everybody that he was a God. Well, that didn't bother Philip none. You know what Philip did? He went over there and he just began to keep preaching Jesus. Just tell him about Jesus. And you know what? Lo and behold, Simon the sorcerer, he got saved. And the Bible says immediately he got baptized. Now, Brother Hill said when you get saved, you ought to be baptized real soon after well, the apostles heard about that. They heard about what was going on over there. 
and they sent Peter and John. And you know what Peter and John said to Philip? Just preach on. Just tell them about Jesus. And then you get over here to our passage, over here in verses 35 through 39. We see Philip exalting. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But then number two, not only Philip exalting, but Philip explaining, explaining. I got to thinking about that today. Usually an evangelist, they don't do a lot of explaining. They just stand up and just preach a gospel message about Jesus. And I, I told you last week, in the ministry, God calls different men with different gifts. Some are called to be apostles. Some are called to be prophets. Some are called to be pastors and teachers. That goes together. That's me. I know that is my ministry gift. I am a preacher, Brother Donnie, and I am a teacher. Hey, I wouldn't want a pastor that couldn't preach, but I wouldn't want a pastor that couldn't teach. I really think it goes together. But then the Bible says some were called to be evangelist. Evangelist. Brother Junior Hill is called to be an evangelist. I know that he is. But sometimes as you're sharing about Jesus, you got to explain some things. I thought it was so profound today when he said that not everybody in church knows how to get saved. Did you hear when he said that? I thought, Lordy be, that could be the case here. They, weren't, they wasn't raised in church. They, they don't know the culture of church. They don't know the atmosphere of church. They don't really know what it means to be saved. They don't know how to be saved. They feel the presence of God, but they don't know what to do with it. So you know what you got to do? You got to explain. And that's what Philip does. In verse number 26, the Bible says that Philip hears the angel of the Lord, the word of God, and says, Go down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And then the Bible says he went. He was obedient, and he meets up with an Ethiopian eunuch. I looked this up today. Ethiopia. I looked up the word. Just wanted to find out what it means. Look this up when you go home. Ethiopia means black. Ethiopia, one place, I, I saw this, it means burned face. Did you know sometimes we tend to think everybody in the Bible is white? I got news for you, nobody in the Bible is white. <laughs> They've all got darker skin than we do. Well, Ethiopia, by the way, Moses was married to Zipporah, probably from Ethiopia. Well, when you look at the map of Africa, Ethiopia is over there on the eastern part called the Horn. I know, I used to teach that. But Ethiopia in the Bible is not Ethiopia on the map today. Hundreds of miles difference. Ethiopia in the Bible is just south of Egypt. So the Bible says that God speaks to Philip and says, go over there to Gaza. And when he gets to Gaza, the desert, he meets, in fact, an Ethiopian eunuch. A eunuch is a male servant who is emasculated to keep him in subjection. Now, this eunuch has authority. In fact, he is the treasurer of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. He's important. He's got a big job. And the Bible says that they went to Jerusalem to worship. You know how they went? They rode in a chariot. And this Ethiopian eunuch is reading my favorite chapter, Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? 
For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes ye are healed. But he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shivers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And Brother Ray, that's exactly what this Ethiopian eunuch is reading in the chariot. He's reading about the lamb. Look at verse 29. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. You know what God's saying to Philip? If you're going to be an evangelist, you got to go to Gaza. you got to go down there to the chariot. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then look at verse 30. And Philip ran to him. That's urgent. Ran to him. And then look what he says. You're reading the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, and he said, well, how can I except some man guide me? You've got to explain it to me. I don't know what this means about the lamb led to the slaughter. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Sit down over here and tell me what the prophet's talking about. What does this mean? You've got to explain to them how they can be saved. And then look at verse number 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. The lamb done before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. And then look at verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, who are you talking about? Who, who, who is, is the prophet talking about himself? Or is it some other man? And you know what? I believe the door was open. That lost man, that man who didn't look like Philip said this, explain this to me. I want to be saved. I really believe that. And I believe that Philip began to talk about the lamb in the Old Testament. The lamb. Where is the lamb? And then I believe that he began to talk about the lamb in the New Testament. Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. You say, how do you know he told him about Jesus? Because verse 35 says so. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus. We see Philip explaining. Tell them how they can be saved. Number one, Philip exalting. Number two, Philip explaining. Number three, Philip evangelizing. Evangelizing. He's called Philip the evangelist. But Sammy, look at this, verse number 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. Think about that. But Jim, they're out there in the desert. And lo and behold... Just out of nowhere, there's a certain water. I don't think it was a big river. I don't think it was uh, Lake Alatoona. I don't think it was a lake or a river. It was probably some kind of well. They call it a wadi, just a little water spot. If you'll notice that, the water was just there. And look at this. The eunuch says, see, here is water. I love this. What does hinder me to be baptized? Brother Barney, he's he's really asking for permission. I want to be baptized. Can I be baptized? What holds me back? What keeps me from being baptized? And then look at verse 37. Philip said, if thou believest with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Sweet little Miss Joan Upton that sits right down there in the front. I told you this morning, she don't ever cause no trouble. Why, I never would have dreamed that. I didn't know that Sister Joan had never been baptized on the right side of salvation. Evidently, God got her attention today. 
And I've, I've never seen Joan really do a whole lot like that, but she slipped up out of her seat, walked down here, and she said, Preacher, I need to get baptized. I need to get my baptism on the right side of salvation. Boy, she was obedient in that. We're going to baptize her next week. First you get saved, and then you get baptized. Now, I know what somebody's saying. Lord God, why they make such a big deal about that baptism stuff? You know why? Because Jesus said in the Great Commission, Go ye, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, when I baptize these little children up there in that tank, Brother Shane, you know, when you baptize them up there in that tank, we are actually fulfilling the Great Commission. That's why they need to get baptized. What does hinder me to be baptized? I didn't know what Brother Hill said today. But he said, and I looked it up. I, when I hear something, i got to make sure they're right. I Googled it today. How far did Jesus travel to be baptized? Seventy miles. Seventy miles. Oh, surely if Jesus will walk 70 miles to get baptized and he's the sinless son of God, surely you would come forward just a few feet. Jesus was baptized when I go to Israel and I'm going sometime. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's a woman. Somebody's going to baptize me in the Jordan River. I may dunk myself. I'm, now, I'm, now that's just a symbolic. I've already been baptized. But I'm going to be baptized there. I want to I wanna do that. Well, I'm almost done. Philip the evangelist. Boy, he's telling people about Jesus. Philip exalting. Philip explaining. Philip evangelizing. And then, Brother Eddie, I love this last part. Somebody ought to just preach this and make it a whole sermon. We see, lastly, Philip exiting. Exiting. One day we're going to make a grand exit. You remember old Kenny Rogers used to sing that song, Let's go out in a blaze of glory. Well, one day we're going to, praise God. We're leaving this place. Look at verse number 39. and, we'll, and we'll look, look at verse 38. Let's look at verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, baptizo, baptized him, immersed him down into the waters, verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Now, I looked this up one time, and nobody really knows what this means. But he's there one moment, and then the next moment, he's gone. The eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Can I say, until the rapture takes place, let's tell everybody about Jesus let me tell you what we're not going to do in heaven. We're not going to do evangelism in heaven. Not going to be winning souls in heaven. Everybody there say, I told you that last week. So until Jesus comes, let's do the work of an evangelist. Now what I want you to do is close your eyes and bow your head. All day long we've talked about telling somebody about Jesus and knowing for sure that you know Jesus. Lord, I want to be like Philip. He, he's Philip the evangelist. What a great title to be called in the Bible. Philip the evangelist. Lord, I understand that I'm a pastor teacher. I know that's what my ministry gift is. But Lord, I'm to do the work of an evangelist. Boy, it thrilled my heart Wednesday night when that lady came and got saved. It thrilled my heart today when, when, when that young girl came and got saved. When I got that text today, from that mama that says her little boy wants to talk about being saved. Boy, that just, that, that thrills me. And God, I want to say again, we want to be a church of evangelism. Thank you, Lord. There may be somebody here tonight. I know it's Sunday night. But maybe you've been dwelling on the sermon today, the message that we heard earlier. And you've been thinking, yeah, I know that I'm saved but just to be honest, after I truly got saved, I, I never followed the Lord and believer's baptism. We don't want to dwell on that too much, but it's very scriptural. 
And you need to take care of that and make sure that the baptism's on the right side of salvation. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, oh, you ought to do that. I pray that somebody might share this passion with me and this burden just to be a little bit more mindful of evangelism. Chances are on a Sunday morning, just like the preacher said today, there's some people that don't even know how to be saved. And God, I pray that we would make salvation so simple that even a child might understand. Lord, if we'll simply say, Jesus, I've sinned. I'm sorry for my sins. I confess it. That just means I tell you what you already know. But I want to repent. I don't want to do those things anymore. I want my life to change. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I do. You, you shed your blood because I'm a sinner. And your blood can wash away all of my sin. And Jesus, you died, but you didn't stay dead. You, you got up on the third day. You're alive. While you're in heaven on the throne and you're coming back real soon, but you're only coming back for saved people. And I don't want to be somebody that's lost. I don't want to be unsaved. I want to go to heaven with you when you come someday. Oh, if you'll mean business with God tonight, he'll mean business with you. Jesus, save me just right there in your seat. Young man, maybe just a little boy or a little girl tonight. Jesus, save me. Maybe an adult, save me. Lord, I pray that we would see more results of what we felt today. And we'd see more salvations and we would see more baptisms. We love you. God, we want to be like Philip the evangelist. While we would tell anybody about Jesus, what color they are doesn't matter. Where they come from don't matter. How much money they got don't matter. But we'd tell them about Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the one that was saved today. We pray that more will be. We pray for our Awana ministry that they'll hear the gospel this year and that they'll be pricked in their heart and they'll be saved. Oh, that's a great place for them to be saved. We pray for the girls' conference this coming weekend. We pray, God, that your spirit will just saturate that meeting. We love you tonight, God. Thank you for being so good to us. Help us to be like Philip the Evangelist. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother David, let's stand and sing.